Please welcome to the stage Gustave Allegret of NTN24 and our esteemed panel. Hello. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming right after lunch. Our staff, but we appreciate that you're interested in the private <coughs> sector and democracy. We have an amazing panel tonight, today. Uh, Dr. Julio Frank, President of the University of Miami. Laura Chinchilla, former President of the Republic of Costa Rica and Vice President of the World Leadership Alliance of the Club de Madrid. And last but not least, Jorge Arveche, uh, Vice President of the Private Sector at the CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America. And if I'm not mistaken, Professor of Economics, also at the University of Brasilia. Thank you all for joining us. This is a conversation. Uh, we're going to avoid individual speeches, but I'm going to allow you for two minutes at the beginning to answer the question, what's the role that you see for private sector in preserving democracy? Dr. Frank. Well, I, I, because of my, of my role, I would like to focus on the role of educational institutions, a large proportion of which are private, <coughs> and even those that are public, when they are autonomous, they really form part of civil society. Um, I, I think universities play a fundamental role in, in the preservation and strengthening of, university, of, of democracy. First of all, a lot of democrat, the democracy movements begun in universities. So we, there's that activist uh, element of universities, but beyond that, in their regular functions, universities have fundamentally two big uh, social functions. One is education. And through education, its contribution to democracy is to educate both a competent workforce, because one of the things that threatens democratic regimes is incompetence on the part of government, and a civic-minded set of citizens, which is part of the educational process. Universities can model the virtues of respectful disagreement and an uh, and, and agreement and, and consensus building, which is essential to democracy. And then on the research, we provide both the data, the scholarship to understand democracy and to be able to document threats to democracy and alternative uh, public policies to uh, help in the policy translation process and the policy formulation and execution. Amazing. Less than two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Arvich. Well, thank you, uh, Gustavo, for the question. Uh, as, as you may know, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is the most unequal region in the world in terms of income inequality. But beyond that, uh, there is a lot of poverty, as you know, and it is also the most urbanized region in the world, meaning that uh, there is a lot of poverty a lot of inequality, a lot, a lot of violence, a lot of informality, and a lot, a, a lot of low productivity in our cities. The only way for us to solve all those problems is by creating jobs, by uh, improving income, and the role of the private sector is absolutely critical there. I understand that, uh, my view is that poverty, this combination of poverty, inequality, informality, low productivity, has a lot to do with democracy because it creates social, political, and economic tension. So we have to create jobs, good jobs. That's something that is not easy. We, we will talk about that for later. Well, I, I, I will add uh, a, a very critical issue, which now is defining uh, how people are feeling. Um, towards the democratic processes. Uh, and part of the problem is that people are losing faith on democratic institutions. What they are asked, for example, in Latin America, uh, how the governments are taking decisions. Almost 80% of the citizens uh, say that governments are taking decisions in favor of the elites, not in favor of the people. And part of the problem is the perception of corruption. So I will say that uh, the corporate sector should avoid capturing uh, governments or capturing public policy. Uh, corporate sector um, is one of the most important stakeholders in trying to build democratic governance. That means basically 
um, doing business according to ethical uh, standards, uh, trying to respect, for example, the rules, um, trying to promote or encourage government uh, to adopt transparency in the contracting processes, for example. So respecting that kind of rules is really critical right now in order to recover the faith of uh, citizens in democracy. Uh, very interesting points, each of you, education, private sector, jobs, faith in institutions. Uh, and you mentioned one that I think it's, trans uh, it's a critical for all of them almost, which is corruption. And what's the role of private sector in the corruption of fight to, to, to avoid uh, and to eradicate corruption from the uh, democracies, particularly in Latin America, which is what we are talking about today, but in general? Well, again, I would um, go to the role of universities here. Um, we studied the process and, on, and tried to understand the root causes. Uh, part of that is certainly um, governance issues, captured by others. For example, we at the University of Miami have a center for democracy, which studies these topics right. and produces evidence about that. And that may then lead to solutions. Uh, the other thing is through research, I think there's an incredible potential to mobilize technology that is uh, corruption proof. For example, the blockchain, everyone thinks that that's for cryptocurrency, but that's only one of its applications and probably the, not the most important, uh, could provide elements and some governments, particularly European governments, had adopted that kind of, of, uh, uh, of technology mm -hmm. to avoid or prevent corruption. And so by both understanding the nature and also proposing solutions, whether it's societal solutions or even technological solutions, I think uh, corruption, like almost any problem we have, is susceptible to being studied, analyzed, and then uh, you know, propose rational solutions uh, to it. I don't think we are intrinsically or genetically corrupt, like some people say. Mm -hmm. That is just one of the many myths. Uh, corruption is one problem that we can analyze and then address uh, through policies and, as I said, also through technology. Well, in, in line with, with what with you just mentioned, I think that there is a lot to do with institutional strengthening and beyond that, transparency, accountability, and better governance. So. Uh, as, as you just mentioned, uh, this is not to say that uh, the private sector in Latin America is more, is more corrupt than any other uh, private sector. No, it, it has, a, from my perspective, it, it has a lot to do with the framework, the institutions, and how uh, their relationship between government and private sector works based on rules, based on, 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 on uh, criteria, uh, based on transparency and all those things. Uh, from my perspective, this, this is the main rule of the game. And what's the role of multilateral institutions in fighting this corruption? Because usually CAF, but also the IDV, World Bank, uh, provides a lot of money to the governments for big infrastructures, and mm -hmm. money is uh, the main objective of the corruption. I mean, what uh, uh, barriers, what uh, protection do you uh, apply to those loans, to those uh, programs to avoid corruption and to make sure that this money goes where it, it, it should go? Well, one of the things that we do a lot uh, is institutional strengthening, being on federal government, central government, and subnational governments as well. This is critical. And in many cases, in many occasions, when we provide resources, a loan or whatever, to a given government, if we perceive that there is no, no uh, let's say, uh, uh, enough institutional uh, framework, we be, be, before going forward, we, we work with that ministry. And uh, another thing has to do with uh, uh, transparency and making market, market uh, works more and better so that you can create competition, transparency, and, and, and uh, let's say the rules of the game for uh, the private sector to be part of the story, not the, to rule the story. Yeah. Yes, according to my experience, the role of the multilateral system is very, very important. For example, when you as a government decide to go through uh, the mechanisms of the multilateral system uh, for the whole procurement process, uh, basically in infrastructure, uh, where the big money is, um, you can really guarantee 
very transparent standards. But when you avoid that kind of mechanisms, you never know what is going to happen. Let's remember, I, I, I know that we are not the uh, corrupt because we are corrupt, but unfortunately, there are big scandals and very recent scandals um, uh, concerning um, the, the, the infrastructure and, and, and corruption, uh, public-private corruption. Uh, but also I want to mention this. Uh, sometimes it starts very early in the political cycle. So political financing mm -hmm. is something we also must tackle. Uh, and, and the corporate sector has the obligation uh, you know, to, 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 to know to know to avoid engaging in those schemes of political financing where the commitments are made to uh, break the rules later on. But who, who has to change the rules for that? Uh, well, because usually the, the, uh, usually, usually are the, the same politicians. No, no, but the <laughs> they are not interested in changing the anything. rules. The rules exist, my dear uh -huh. friend. Uh, you in most of the countries you have very clear rules which are applied by the electoral management uh, bodies. Um, but sometimes they don't respect them. Mm -hmm. uh, that is why I was mentioning trying to avoid the temptation to capture uh, the, uh, the politicians, the governments, part of the public policy, because sometimes, uh, sometimes people want to put the money, but they want the candidate knows who put the money. And, and, and in that process, mm -hmm. some norms are violated. Uh, so I, I, it's, of, of course, there is a big responsibility on the part of the political side, but the corporate sector also has to behave according to the ethical standards. Dr. Frank. You know, <clears throat> we, we tend to focus on corruption that involves money, and that's obviously the biggest part. But there's another form of corruption, which is uh, incompetence. Uh, the appointment of people who are not uh, yeah, well uh, capable of, of, of uh, carrying out a particular uh, job because of political loyalty. And um, you know, I've seen in, in my own country how a civil service that was built with a lot of effort was dismantled and explicit declarations that rather than competence, we, uh, we give priority to political loyalty to the president or whoever it is. Uh, that is a form of corruption and we need to emphasize the eroding factor of, of incompetence hand, as part of corruption and then the other forms of corruption, yes. but incompetence as one of the issues that's undermining the support, popular support for, uh, for democracy. People, survey after survey shows that people want government that functions, that solves problems. And both corruption and incompetence erode that trust in government. And so people will say, no, you know, the recent coup d'etat in, in Africa, with people going out to cheer because they believe that that will now produce a competent uh, leadership. So what we need to talk about is competent democracy. I think competence, which is where universities play a very important role in producing competent citizens, is one of the most urgent uh, tasks. That's the fertile ground for populism. But what happened when the leader who is being elected is incompetent. I'm not going to mention, but you can think in at least two or three. <laughs> too many right examples. Now. Yeah, <laughs> right now in Latin America right. and in recent years, even in North America. Right. Let's put it that way. So what happened when people <coughs> choose incompetent leaders that they know that they are not capable of, but they love their ideas, if any? That, that is the risk that, that some of these, which tend also to be populist, exploit previous incompetence and present themselves as the bearers of the solution, uh, uh, get into power and then erode democracy and avoid the subsequent functioning. The correction in democracy would be that you vote them out of office, you don't re-elect them. But if the leader uh, himself, which is usually a man, uh, uh, erodes democracy, that's, that's why we need to start from the root causes and I think corruption and this variant of incompetence are, are critical. Love. Yes, uh, not necessarily uh, the leaders decide about everything. Uh, we are talking, uh, with some exceptions in Latin America, about governments uh, who, uh, that already have a structure, a bureaucracy, uh, procedures, etc., etc. So sometimes I find that, you know, uh, 
some use the excuses that, well, the leader asked me to, uh, and, and not necessarily uh, that happens in such a way. Now, having said that, I also, I also want to, um, to aware against the temptation, which is something that has happened very clear in the cases of Venezuela, in the cases of Nicaragua, when the corporate sector uh, decided that you know, the most important thing was uh, to, 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 to do business. And they prefer to deal directly uh, with the leader in very personal way in order to get uh, you know, the decision taken. A and in doing that, they were uh, facilitating the concentration of more and more power in that leader. When they realized what they were doing, it was too late for them. Okay, that is the case of Nicaragua. What happened in Nicaragua? The private sector, in certain way, uh, but, uh, la, contributed but to the Chinchilla, process of some, some of those business, so, some of those business persons are afraid also of losing everything. Look what happened in Venezuela. At the beginning, Chavez won yeah. with the support of an important part. I don't know exactly how many, but an important part of the business people, and they realized that they made a mistake but they support him in the very beginning. And they, they didn't want to lose their businesses, so, so they embraced the leader. Right. I, I remember, let me tell, give you my example. Um, I remember that some business uh, people visited me when I was president and telling me, uh, Madam President, we are, living, uh, we are moving to, uh, to, 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 to Nicaragua to, to do business there. And when I asked why, they basically told me everything is faster because there is one person who decides about how to resolve the problems. But I, I couldn't offer that, because in my country we have to follow the rules. And, and, and well, five years later, of course. Uh, they returned. They, yes. They and returned. you were waiting for them, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So two comments. Uh, uh, one thing is the government borrowing from us. Another thing is delivery. And it has a lot to do with capacity uh, for delivery, and not necessarily, not, not always, of corruption. No, no. A, a, a second comment has to do with an empirical evidence that suggests that uh, countries where uh, that are less diversified in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, production sectors tend to be more corrupt because you have fewer people taking more decisions based on those. Uh, 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 that because they drive those very big and concentrated sectors. So diversification of, 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 of the economy and competition go hand in hand with, uh, with uh, more and better transparency and, 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 and governance. Well, well quite uh, interesting conversation. We are running out of time, but I have a final question for you all. And I'm going to start with uh, uh, President Chinchilla. Uh, Every country is different, every society is different, mm -hmm. but what is, in your perspective, you all, uh, what should be the percentage of the uh, weight of the private sector and the public sector in a society in which public sector assures access to education, healthcare, basic rights for the citizens, but it's not that big that strangles the private sector and the private sector could flourish, could pay taxes, and could uh, create jobs to make a, a, an economy productive. What's the percentage, the balance? Where is, I, where is the line? I, I, I couldn't come up with a percentage. I think what is important for, from the perspective of a political leader is to be open uh, to uh, constantly um, uh, you know, redesign the relationship between the private and the public sector. Um, according to the needs, according to the context. Uh, you, you, you cannot uh, be very rigid about in which areas the private sector can participate, in which one they cannot. I think this is a very kind of dynamic relationship uh, which is changing according to the circumstances, according to the context. Dr. Frank. Well, I think of three fundamental functions that need to be performed, protection, promotion, and production. In well-functioning countries, the government does has protection as the base, 
protecting in, in the broad sense of the word, we don't have time to go, including social protection, that's health, promoting through incentives to taxes, through investment in science, technology, and higher education, and very little production. In poorly run countries, that pyramid is inverted, and the country is doing a lot of the production, very little promotion, and becomes the main violator of human rights in its own country. So we need to decide what kind of pyramid we want, and, and uh, I think the pyramid where protection is the fun fundamental function, and the private sector does most of the, of the production, is the one that has proven to be, be better. And finally, uh, uh, ju just a quick comment. It has a lot to do with the size of the economy. Uh, if, you're, if, if you're talking about a, a small economy, the size of the government may be higher than otherwise, uh, because uh, the private sector may not have enough room for uh, making money and for doing business. Uh, so the, the government may have to be in several sectors in order to make them work. Dr. Julio Frank. Jorge Arbache and Laura Chinchilla, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.